And are you okay, Mick? Yeah, yeah, I'm good, man. That's good. That's good. It wouldn't be a Tigers episode without talking during the intro. Oh, I don't geez. even know if it was deliberate or not, but it wouldn't be the same without it. Now, <laughs> welcome everyone to the show. Uh, sorry, sorry. No, no need to be sorry. I, I like it. It adds a bit of humour. I never know what's going to happen. I, it keeps me on my toes. And it was completely unmeant, people. It was just like <laughs> Red came rain has hurt himself. Poor guy. Yeah, that, I don't like reading that. So I did get a text about that. So all the best to Cam Rainer and anyone else who's been injured in the last few weeks. And it's actually been quite a few, which is a little bit alarming. Um, yeah, lob, lob with his knee yesterday. Yeah, yeah, lob with the knee. Yeah, yeah reduce interchange, fatigue the players. That's what happens. I suppose they're coming off, um, what, one practice match prior. And they would do, obviously, intra-clubs and things like that. But... Yeah, hopefully we don't see too much more of this because, yeah, yeah it's a sad story for all those players who work their ass off to, to get a few weeks out from round one, then this happens. Yeah, let's what... hopefully it's not a season injury, um, season, um, you know, ending injury. Let's hope it's only, you know, four or five weeks and he gets back into it. Yeah. And, and what did we say with our practice match? We said no injuries, please. And, yeah, <laughs> Football exactly. gods, no injuries. <laughs> You can be certain that every other supporter from every other club would have just hoped for the same thing. Um, and we were obviously blessed and very lucky. We got away unscathed, which is nice. Um, yeah. For once. Uh, before the we Danaher, get stuck the into Danaher, it, okay, the Danaher, the Danaher effects kicking in at Brisbane too. Half time, Gold Coast fifty three, Brisbane uh, five goals straight thirty. Five goals yeah, straight. Okay. Five goals straight. But that's um pretty worrisome for um Brisbane if they're. Getting um, beaten by Gold Coast. Oh shit, he's playing know. too. He's on the screen yeah. right now. Doesn't you know he? they've got Danaher, and, and apparently, according to the footy, you know, I'm doing guys just give you a visual because we're obviously in a in in a non visual uh, medium. Um, you know the um, air inverted commas. You know they've got apparently air inverted commas the best list. Um, surely inverted commas must be top two list um, to be you know giving Gold Coast Suns that type of a head start doesn't bode well. Gold Coast were pretty good though at, out of the blocks last year. I know that yep. I know Brisbane are meant to be obviously like your top four kind of team. So yeah, yeah. But you know, air inverted commas, they're not a top two list, are they? Gold Coast, you know. So, oh, Gold Coast aren't. No, God no. No, no. So they should have be um beating them around the contest and um yeah, getting it inside fifty, nice and easy. Is Matt Rowe playing? Uh, I don't know. Just it's half time, so but I just saw it down here in his screen, oh, just okay. saw the score, so. But yeah, so it's a nice little lead to the Suns. Go Suns. Yeah, Very go good. Suns. Before we get stuck into it a bit more, I, I do have to give a shout out to the Carlton Nuffies on Twitter and any other form of social media who have in their wisdom decided to compare the Zach Williams incident in which he got a week for jumping off the ground and hitting someone in the head where the ball was nowhere near them to Trent Cochin who won the ball against Dylan Shield. Um, and that wasn't the thing that actually injured Dylan Shield, mind you, but let's not uh, let facts ruin a good story. <laughs> yeah. So... To the Nuffies out there, you can't compare the two. That yellow thing that Koch had in his hand is a very, very big point of difference. Zach Williams was nowhere near the ball, decided to jump, hit the bloke in the head, and gets the week he deserves. End of story. Yeah, yeah Carlton supporters, that's all you had to say, mate. You know, they're and, a special breed. And, and keep, it, keep in mind, Patrick David, it was more aligned to um, anything than Trent Cochin, but they won't talk about that. No, no of no. course not. No, Definitely no, not. No. no. They're... Um, yeah, like Malcolm says, you know, lucky he's not a blue supporter. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we might have, we might hear from Malcolm next week. Yeah, right? we will. We will. We will. Leading up to round one. He well, might I make actually, an appearance. when it's my turn on the agenda, I've got um, I actually had a really good um chat about the myth about um Richmond's team, current team versus you know the best sides of Brisbane Hawks and um, the Hawks and the Cats. So um. Yeah, he came out with a few salient points, and I want to share it with the listeners when we get to that stage. Looking forward to that very much. Uh, in the meantime, we obviously had our practice game against the Pies on Friday night. It was good to see uh, footy back with the crowd, first and foremost. Um, well done to everyone who got along to the game. It was it was pleasing to hear the real crowd noise as opposed to the fake noise. As, as much as I get why they were trying to do it, it, it can't replace the real thing, can it? No. Oh, before we start, boys, I, I really want to say he doesn't know I'm going to do this. Um, good mate of mine, really good poster on big footy um sunshine boy mate just thinking about your buddy um uh, yeah just keep your head up buddy 
that's all I wanted to say, really. Just Absolutely, like, no, Sunshine. Be, yeah, right from the whole team at the BF Tiger Cast, you know, we're with, right with you. Absolutely. Yep. With you all the way, mate. And hopefully you got to see uh, a pretty good game on the Friday night, the Tigers. We, yes, we, yes. We win by five points. I mean, this score's largely oh, irrelevant. but yeah. I think, and I read this comment a few times on various platforms, and I think it rang true that it was probably the best practice match we've played in a few years. Like usually we kind of just, not half after so that's a bit disrespectful, but we just ease into it. Um, the stars just do enough kind of thing. But when you have your skipper, who's on the, the latter side of his career, let's be honest, diving in, putting smothers on in a practice match, Dusty going into beast mode, you know the boys are switched on and ready for a big year. You know, for me, what that practice match showed me was um, two things. The first thing that really stood out to me is the shortened preseason. Um, the players are obviously a lot fresher. You know, we haven't got, like last year, we put a lot of our players like we normally do in heavy training phases. So that's why generally in our pre-seasons, we're coming towards the end of it and our pre-season matches are pretty shit. Um, uh, want for another turn. So the shorter pre-season, they looked fresher. What really pleased me is you could tell the boys went, okay, Collingwood needed to win this. It's funny, it's a preseason game, and I cannot believe it's the first time in a preseason I'm actually going to say this. But Collingwood wanted to win that game. They had a shocking off season. People are writing them off. They had a really strong. Yeah, they didn't have Tay Tay, and they were missing a few other plotters. But outside of that, um, you know, we're missing Prestia. We didn't have Lynch, so it was pretty balanced it out. Um, they wanted to win. They put a strong side out. And they kept, as long as they could, they kept that side on the park. Um, we benched most of our stars in the third quarter. So, but when it was hot, we played with them. They didn't threaten. The, um, they flooded like they normally do, but they couldn't penetrate our defensive 50, and we kept on rebounding at will. Our transition from midfield to forward still needs a fair bit of work when we're, when we're subjected to that flood. But it was better to see. We actually can see, that I, I could see the method, the way that we shared the ball around to try to um, open them up and spread them wide was that we've put work into that, um, into that um, combating that mega flood that teams try to do to, you know, slow our rundown. But um, the other big thing that really stuck out to me was how quick are our kids and how quick are our boys, you know, special mention to RCD. Yeah. You didn't play many minutes, mate, but you, sh- you showed me in five minutes with your clean hands, you know, particularly in the contest. Um, he did about three or four handballs that led to scoring shots um, you know, by getting the ball um, released into traffic, into the right hands. Well done, mate. Um, Chol is oh, funny. Going to say it. I reckon he's a ruckman. I reckon. I don't reckon he's a. I don't reckon he's a forward. I reckon he needs to run around the ground. I reckon he's a hybrid ruck. Yep. Um, that that's just. I, I came out of that game thinking, no, nah, he's a hybrid ruck. He he can't play forward. Let's just put him in the in the ruck and let him run the, the two wings, um, and, and in that area there, and just let him let him play as he. I don't see him as a systems type. Funny because we're all about system. I don't see him as a systems type instinctive player. He's he's all about instinct. He's all about I need to run. I need to get ball and make he's something happen. See, see ball, get ball. And yeah, I think, yeah, I think so, we've said it here for a couple of seasons now that he just looks yeah. lost up for it. He's not hasn't yeah. got the awareness to be a forward. And he's ruck like while he might not win all the ruck contests, his competitiveness and uh, his speed and being agile at ground level is actually quite handy to have. Yeah, he'd be perfect half forward flanker that um, roamed right up the ground. You know, the one that takes the mark at 60 metres. You know, he'd be perfect because he, he would trouble a lot of sides with that. I reckon that's hopefully what we end up doing with him. Um, but look, I was really pleased, you know, Koch, all of our main guns look free. I was really happy for Jack. He looked like he got his jump back again. He looked like he, his movement, his lateral movement, which was, it took a long time coming for him last year, was there already, which was fantastic to see. Um, yeah, so I was pretty pleased, and, and I was and I was wrapped for players like Caddy, who I reckon showed a bit. He worked his tail off. Uh, McIntosh is is just taken off from where he's left off last year, which is great. Um, yeah, so I don't see as you know how some players regress if they've had a good year. I didn't see any of that regression with any um, any of them starting twenty two like Arts. He works. I can see why we chose him over. Um, over uh, um, Higgins, you know, like obviously Higgins, we would have loved for him to stay, but it would be between him and Arts and Higgins realised he's not going to be able to probably muscle Arts out of that role. And I could see it because the amount of work that he did, Rioli does in relation to the pressure, running into space, 
um, to block to block that space for um, Collingwood to you know get a free ball. Brilliant. Now I was really happy with the boys. Yeah, that, that was solid. CB. Yeah, look, a lot of the points that um, Tiggs has raised, uh, I found it funny that Collingwood. You know the pressures on a coach when he keeps his players on. Like to go, he copped a heavy knock to the leg late in that last quarter, and they were still trying to win it, and he put him back on the park, which was um, surprising. But it sort of shows you where the two clubs are at. I think. I think that's that's really what came out of that. Um, as far as the players are surprised, I don't think we had players who were surprised. I think we had. Um, it was sort of what I expected, honestly. It was more. I thought. Um, you know, that, that last quarter, the young blokes stood up against the Collingwood midfielder Pendlebury and to go in those guys. So young Martin and um, RCD were really good. And there was no one that really disappointed me, to be honest. I, I thought everyone yeah. everyone contributed in, in our um, over our four quarters, which was fantastic. I want to see if you guys agree with my observation. I don't want to feel like I'm alone. But has Asprey trimmed down? quite a bit. He seemed to, he, to me, he looked the fittest he's been in terms of getting around the ground, which may coincide with the fact he's having to do some ruck work. So he does have to be a bit more mobile, but he was looking really sharp around the ground. First of all, mate, you're never alone. Let's just put that out there. <laughs> uh, you'll never be alone. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking for CB as well. We'll always be with you, buddy. Um, look, on Asprey, for me, he looked hungry. Yeah, he, he looked, had, looked really determined. It was really he looked, surprising, yeah. if I'm being honest. And I think, and hopefully he's over his knee. I reckon, uh, hopefully he's over his knee well, and he's... Yeah, that's what, like, when I thought saw how sort of fit he was, I thought if he's dropped a few kilos, that's going to obviously help alleviate minor, I know, but alleviate some, maybe some knee stress issues as well, which is a good thing. Yeah. Now he looked really fresh. I, it's going to be, sounds funny, because he's a two-time premiership player now, or three-time. Um. He it looked like to me he's got belief. You know, he looked like a player that knows, you know what, I'm one of the best defenders in the league. I'll control yeah. my opponent. Whereas sometimes with Ashbury, he reminds me, he just stops, um, you know, he concentrates on his opponent as a stopper. This one, he just had a commanding presence about him. And, uh, yeah, I hope he continues with it because he's, he's a jet, dead set gun. And, CB, I have to ask you, how excited were you with Camden McIntosh's game? Yeah, I'm always excited when I see Camden <laughs> and Nathan Broad out there on the field doing their business. And Arts, um, Arts had, a, had a good one too. You're... Arts had a bloody good game. So here's the thing. So, so there's a point for, for, for people listening. We have a bit of a rundown sheet. And one of the questions is, um, did CCJ do enough to take child spot once available? Well, if I'm honest with you, um, in round one, obviously CCJ isn't going to be in the team. But to be honest, if I was picking if all the players were available – I actually wouldn't have I wouldn't have CCJ or Chol in the team in round yeah, one. Yeah, agree, agree, 100% agree. CCJ, now I wanted to pose a question to you two guys. He's got the tools, you can see it. For his size, he's got the mobility, he's got the body strength, right? But his timing is woeful. Like when he goes for a mark, he either, the ball either goes over his head, and for a tall, that's inexcusable, or he he, he just mistimes his. What do you reckon? Do you reckon it's because he hasn't played enough games? Do you think yeah, I, it's just confidence? That's all it is? I think he just needs time in the seniors, if I'm yeah. honest. And he'll get it. He, there's no doubt. There's no doubt in my mind. Um, CCJ, um, RCD and Ross are going to play some serious footy this year. No doubt in my mind. But I just think right now, if you're picking um, 22 players, um, I don't see any of them those two blokes in, in the team. So you would oh. go Nankervis and Asri slash Bolter rucking? Bingo. Yep. Okay. And I'd bring in Pace. So so obviously we've got Prestia and Lynch to, to come in. So you've got your two tall forwards. Um, and I'll tell you what, Jakey Arts and Josh Caddy have put some serious some serious runs on the board to get reselected. So I think Marlon Pickett will be unlucky. And I don't know who else. Oh, can we give a can we give a shout out to Nan Curvis? How good does he look? He he like schooled he, Brundy the first time. Oh, yeah. he did, and yeah. he is he is what I saw. It's not the first time I've seen it a few times, but now like he was creative with his tap work. Like he knew he couldn't beat Grundy with you know getting over the top of him. So what he was doing as the ball was coming up and they were both contesting, he was going in under Grundy. So basically, uh, once Grundy's got the tap, he would then grab the ball and then move it to our direction. Um, it was brilliant. He's, he's, but he's, he has this aggression about him. He's, and he's still a kid in ruck terms. Um, we got a, we got. I would not be surprised in five years if he's rated one of the best ruckmen, 
that we've had in a long, long while. We've had some really good quality ones, but he, um, he's, he's. Uh, Acceleration of development is amazes me when I look at him. Yeah. You know what and I mean? Well, uh, so I was just going to say, I think what you'll find, Tiggs, is the blokes who normally jump over him, like and, and Nick Natanui and those type of guys, and are gone. He's now jumping earlier and he's jumping into them. That's so right. Can't good. get over yeah. the top. Yeah. So he's, yeah. he's actually knocking them off the center. He's actually knocking them off and getting hands of the ball, which is perfect. Yeah, and, I love it. and even if that just halves the contest, that's a good enough result for our blokes. It just as because, long as they as long as the other team's not getting a silver plate of service, that's a win. Because he knows he'll beat um, no matter if it's a Nick Nat, in no matter if it's a Grundy, whoever it is, or a Gorn, if the ball's on the ground, he will beat them with work rate. Oh, um, he's fierce. The ball to us. Yeah, and he's like a midfielder. Yeah. Um, like Nick Nat, yeah, he's flashy, but he hasn't got a tank. Right. So yeah, Nick Nat in a one on one contest might beat him, but you know, do that for, you know, a hundred minutes, see who's gonna win more contests or not on the ground. It's gonna be Nick uh, it's gonna be um Nan Curvis. So yeah, we've I was I was stoked watching his performance. I, I just love what he did. The one that disappointed me, if we have to have someone that's that was a bit disappointed, and I'm I'm not being too hard hopefully not being too harsh on him because he disappointed me because I believe I've turned the corner around with him. I thought he was just a stopgap. But now I actually think he's a pretty good role player. Um, but can take the next level. Was Pickett funny enough? I found him very vanilla. Um, he did some good things, but it was no different from last year, um, some of his games. I just expected him to... He only plays you know, well in grand finals. He doesn't care yeah, about the rest does. of it. <laughs> no, I know you I thought he was... I actually thought he was pretty good, if I'm honest. But yeah. the unfortunate thing for him is he's on the peripheral. Yeah. And we've only got 22 opening spots. And uh, unfortunately, no knock on him because I think he's a fantastic player. And Jizzy provides a nice hard jet. Jizzy smashes him in tackles. Oh, he loves but, it. Um, but I just think in my 22, he's not there at the moment, which is yeah. great, which, which is a good problem to have. It's a fantastic problem to have. Uh, Georgi Castagna, four goals. If he does that most weeks, we will be a very, very good side and a hard one to score against or score more than, should I say. So that was a, a nice little change from him. The, uh, the other stat I want to just put out there, and I don't know if this is a correlation with the new stand rule or not. Last year, given it was shortened quarters, so we'll keep that in mind, but last year, the most marks we took in a game was 89. And last, on Friday night, sorry, we took 136 marks. That yep. is a huge difference. Um, and it was a different type of game <laughs> style that we haven't really seen from us, but it kind of allowed us to pick our way through Collingwood, if I'm honest. I, I didn't mind it, but it's going to be interesting to see if that's a new sort of tactic or a way forward for us, or, or if that's just how the, the game unfolded. As I, I think we discussed it last week, the teams who can kick properly are the teams who are going to best exploit this rule because they'll be the ones to hit the inside 40 kick and get that quick ball movement. The, the teams that have uh, got a few ball butchers in there, when that ball turns over on the half-back line, mate, just watch that thing fly against the Tigers or, you know, a Geelong or, or some teams who can use the ball. And um, it's going to be – there's actually going to be blowouts. Like this, this rule isn't going to bring teams closer. This is actually going to further divide the bottom and the top, I reckon. Well, this is exactly what I said. Um, with this rule – but first of all, with the marks, it's, it's an aberration. And, and I'll, say, I'll, I'll clarify that saying it's a Collingwood aberration. They mega flooded. So what you basically do, we tr- we've obviously tried a new system where share the ball more, s- try to spread them wide. So it was rarely do our back line kick backwards or to the side, but they're doing that a lot. They'll share. And if you look at these stats too, Grimes had a lot of marks, you know, a lot of uncontested marks. So most of our backs had a lot of uncontested marks. Um, so that, that's in part of it. I think Collingwood's game style lended itself to us to having this uncontested game, but like I predicted, guy, like my a couple of my mates that are actually in the industry sort of predicted to me, I should say, um, this rule favours us because, one, we've got good kicks, two, we've got speed, three, we've got creativity, and four, and the biggest one is each player knows where another player is going to be. So, um, you know, where a person can't go around the mark, we know, okay, they're, they're stationary, we know if we've got to hit the inside 40 kick, if we want to run around them, if we want to hand, um, you know, give it to a release player to run right through, all that sort of stuff. And it showed. We uh, we haven't moved the ball that fast. And you've got to keep in mind, too, and this is the biggest thing that struck me. Normally, when you're playing a flooding side, I actually did it today. I watched the game against Collingwood last year who did the basically the same game plan and how he moved the ball compared to this preseason game. Now, I know it's a preseason game, but Collingwood um, played was as much in 
integrity as they played when we played with them. I think it was around four or five, whatever it was. We moved the ball probably, I would say, 50% faster just by that rule, just by being able to, you know, flick it on either by foot or by hand and continue to keep the ball in movement. And it buggered Collingwood. They, they, they were exhausted. And our boys just look fresh. They do. They, they, you look, know, they look good. Yeah, because we, we were an endurance-based side. We always have been. So, yeah, it's going to really help us. And the last question before we quickly go on to the next topic, just a, a quick one-word answer from both. Is Egg Melissi Smith leading the race for the last spot, CB? No. No. Tiggs? No? Okay. No. I think that's coming up soon, the cutoff, so we'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, it's tomorrow, isn't it, the cutoff? Yeah, it might <clears> be tomorrow or <throat> Wednesday, something like that. It's oh, very it's close. the 9th, I thought it was. Yeah, oh, course. okay. Oh, we'll, soon, we'll all soon find out. We're going to do a bit of a, a top eight prediction. I'll just let you two do it, because to be honest, I've been at a kid's play centre all day, so I haven't had time to research. Um, so we'll just rip through this with what you think your top the top eight will look like come end of season, and even just track in who you think two bolters might be and two sliders. CB, you have a crack first. <clears throat> Rightio. From one down to eight, I have Port Adelaide finishing top, Richmond finishing second, Lions and Cats rounding out the top eight, uh, top four. Then I have St Kilda, West Coast Eagles, Bulldogs, and GWS sliding into the eight. Mm-hmm. My Bolters are GWS and Gold Coast. My sliders are Pies and Hawthorne. Yeah, well, I mean, based on the uh, the game I saw on the weekend, Hawthorne and Kangaroos, Hawthorne weren't that great, and I don't know what that says about the Kangaroos because they were just shit house. Anyway, uh, Tiggs, what's your top eight prediction and your bolters and sliders? Yeah, I've got Port first. I'm going to agree in Sarah. You know, they um, they always go first. They'll be first because of their um, home ground advantage. Um, Ditto Lions. I put them second. Look, I put us third. Um, we like third. We, we'll take that. Yeah, we, that's what I mean. Like, I sort of picked it because, you know, I like third. But look, we could finish anywhere. We won't finish any lower than third. So we could finish first, second. Or, first or second, it wouldn't surprise me. But third, um, Cats fourth. Um, I put down um, St Kilda as with, with not that much conviction. I think they're just riding on momentum of last year. If they start the season well, I can see them finishing fifth. West Coast, though I'm not, I'm starting to lose faith in them. I reckon they'll they'll come back in. I still haven't jumped off the Giants. I reckon they'll they'll finish in seventh or eighth spot, so seventh spot. But my Smoky boys, that I like the recruits that they brought. I like I like them. What I've seen from them in the preseason, their methodology, their player, their ball movement, they're starting to become a bit more predictable um, to each other. Is Melbourne? Um, so I think they might actually get into the eight. They've got a good enough in. They've got a more than enough um, better midfielder. My worry is they're kicking, um, obviously with the new rule, but in saying that they've got a good quality midfield that this new rule should help. They've brought in some dash. They've brought in some speed. Um, and they've got big Benny Brown to come back in up forward. That's right. They've got a, now a decent anchor forward. You know, they're not, you know, playing McDonald as their main one. So mm-hmm. they've got some creative smalls. So I can I can make a case for Melbourne. I They're a good contested side. They always have been. Um and I reckon with Goodwin being, he knows if he's not having a good year, they're going to get the he's going to get the ass. I reckon he's going to he's going to coach with abandon. He's going to coach bravely, um, and he won't be conservative because what's the point? You're still going to lose your you lose your job. So yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. No, fair. All I can't disagree with too much of that, fellas. Very good. But the dogs surprised. Yeah, I reckon the dogs are, are different from C- CB's. Probably our biggest difference is. I don't know what the dogs. Beveridge smells to me. I don't think they're a United club. It's just just feelings and stuff I've heard. I might it might rear its ugly head this year. Oh, watch this space. Oh, yeah, the we'll one see. The, the team we all want to slide as a Richmond supporter is Geelong, just with the the first round pick. Even if they finish eighth, I'd be happy just to, to get a better pick from them. But um, yeah, be interesting to see how they go with their recruits too. They're still a bit slow, but they've got some good targets. Well, look, Essendon challenged him. I watched that game just to see Higgins didn't add anything. Like, they had a good quality midfield already. Midfield already. So, generally, when you add someone, they should raise that wherever line that they're playing on an extra level. I didn't see that. Um, they get Jerry McCameron. Yeah, there's Hawkins and now Cameron. But it didn't make their forward line any more dangerous, in my mind. Um Getting and the Hawks player that they got in his name just escaped me on the top of my head. 
Isaac Smith. Play. Isaac Smith, yeah, again, didn't elevate them. So I'm not as sold by the names. People are hearing the names and going, you know, remembering how they were in their prime. They're not in their prime. And, and yeah, Essendon cool. showed that. Essendon played a bog, basic game plan, which was always wrapped for tuck. They just played a similar to a Tiger Soul, you know, an aggressive at the man, you know, front on at the contest. Uh, but they're bog average. They're, you know, I've got them bottom four, Essendon. And but that you know honesty in in their in their method of play troubled the cats. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully yeah. everyone else can trouble them and help us out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no, but look, I, I I like the cats as a club. Geelong as a club, don't misunderstand me. But uh, yeah, I I'm not sold on who they brought in. Fair enough. Well, there we go. So there's your predictions. We might have to revisit that come seasons end and see how close you both got. Uh, now CB came to me during the week and he's demanded a intro for his bloodbath segment. No, he didn't demand it. He just th- he threw a suggestion out there and I, I quite liked it. So I'm going to play the intro and then I'll throw to you, CB. All right, CB, give it to us, mate. What's the bloodbath this week? <coughs> I so hope that worked. <laughs> I heard it, so I hope it came through on the recording. Please I know you two couldn't Aretha. hear it. I couldn't hear it. Is it Aretha Franklin? Is it something like, is that is that what the, you know, her singing? Because that, that's what this bloodbath deserves. Someone, no, know. no, no, mate. What it got was Rick James. Let me tell oh. you. Right. <laughs> anyway, I'll shut up. Go for it, Steve. Go for it, mate. Um, now, I will put a disclaimer straight away. Tiggs, I'm going to say something during this bloodbath, and you're going to want to interrupt and go berserk. Can you let me finish? And then you'll have your moment. And trust me, when you hear it, you will know it. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Okay, okay. All I'll say before you start, mate, you fucking leave Nash alone. You leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back to buddy. <laughs> Nash, no. So, uh, <laughs> my, right, uh, Nathan Buckley. So I'm the first to admit, I actually don't mind listening to Bucks. I find him well thought out and articulate, but Bucks, you're full of shit. Your denials and rewriting of your history is starting to catch up. Firstly, your handling of the Lumumba situation. It seems you weren't quite honest with us there, Bucks, were you? Then there was the statement on now being in a position to be able to target big names, having not had the money to compete with Richmond in the bid for Tom Lynch. That's the point, people, I think. Yep. (laughs) And now we see you questioning Adam Trelaw's professionalism and that he took the trade personally because he's not returning your phone calls. And Tom Phillips took his trade to Hawthorne professionally. Yeah, you're right. After you telling Adam that his teammates don't want him there and you guys trying to shaft him financially, it's wrong of Adam to be upset and think that Collingwood is a shit club. Bucks, it seems you went to the Maguire School of Spin. How about rather than deny the obvious, man up, own it and move on. Never treat the punters as suckers. There's only one way that ends, and it's not our tears. Did he really get shitty about Troll not answering calls yeah, after yeah, the way he got it. treated? Yeah. Like Troll had yeah. every right oh. to never oh, answer a call from them ever again. Mate. That was disgusting. And I know he's we've given Troll all shit along the journey because of what you know the all the shit he said. You know, a bit of all a bit of fun, but no one deserves to be treated like that behind closed doors, let alone publicly. Mate, he's lucky Troll all's not a wog, right? Because if someone asks me to take um, change my salary five times to the benefit of the company I'm working for. You've got to not forget that. That's what Trelaw did. He he cut his wage, but then extended his contract to, to help this club. And then they asked him without telling him anything, right? And then with all this, he's not professional and stuff. I'd slash Buckley's tyres, and that's just something <laughs> nicely, right? Mate, we wogs and revenge is best served cold. No, Buckley for me is just, you could tell it, that he... he yeah, look, I, I said enough last week about Buckley. I'm not going to repeat myself with it just to try to keep this short, but spot on, good blood bust. Yeah, well done, um, CB. That's, that's and look, a well-aimed one. To talk about the trade, literally, they pitched Tom. Uh, they were a year late. We worked on Tom Lynch um, a year before they did, but they came in um, 15 months into it. Um, that's a proven fact now. The records have sort of admitted that if you go back through. Um, they pitched in the world. They actually went to the Sorrento Football Club. I've done a bit of groundwork before this project to make sure my facts are right here. They went to the Sorrento Football Club, gave them a wallop of money to try to convince Tom's dad um, to, you know, look favourably on their offer. Um, they offered him uh, more than us. Um, and I, I 
I'm sure here. I've got to be careful here, but um, we're, when you know people talk about Dusty's contract, it, um, this was more. And the reason why this was more um, is because they lost out on Jonathan Brown. Um, and Eddie was big on, oh, we're not going to lose another power forward. Can you imagine if we had got John O'Brown? Um, yeah, whatever he wants, we give him. Um, and he knocked that back to come to us. And one of the reasons why he did that, and one of the biggest reasons was, is because everything we said to Lynch wasn't promises, like, oh, we promise you're going to get this. You're gonna... It was all factual. Look, we can't predict what's going to happen in the future, but we can tell you this in the club, you'll be this and this and this and this. Um, and we didn't bullshit him. And they even had their fucking recruiter, you know, get sprung and jump, the jump over the fence. And, Which was denied no, they, later on. <laughs> yeah, and they would have shedded players for him. That's also, yeah. you know, if, if you're in the if you're in the know, you know this, what I'm telling is true. They, that If you go back till then, there were already players got tapped on the shoulder. Look, if we can get Lidge, this is at the pies, we're going to have to trade you. Right. So, moral so, of the story is, Buck, stop talking shit. We yeah, know you're, you're bullshitting us. As, as CB said, you can't bullshit us punters, and if you do, you're just going to end up on the podcast, and we're going to shame you. That's how yeah, it works. Talk- That's yeah, how we talk- roll. <laughs> now, can I give... You got a Mythbuster, talk- Tiggs? Yeah, yeah, really, and I don't want to take all the credit. I want to give the credit to Malcolm. Now, he's probably in Swan Street <laughs> at the moment. Malcolm, I know you're listening, hopefully listening to this on the iP- iPhone. I think you stole... Hopefully, hopefully you still got credit. So you can, you know, go onto the iTunes and, you know, download the podcast. But we were talking about what makes a, you know, what's a great side. You know, people, um, you know, on the radio, Richmond gets referred to, yeah, you know, we're a great team, right? But, you know, we've got bog average players. You know, there's some Colts and Nuffy saying Daniel Riol is a bog average player. You know, he can't believe he's got three flags. And George is his name is a, Oh, I don't even know what his name is. Flog. Um and then you've got people slagging off, you know, uh, George, you know, Georgie. And, you, and you've got players, you know, slagging off Broad um, and players of that ilk saying they're not really good players, right? And you, and you have, you know, your, your experts are saying that, like your Robbo, you know, they're good bog average players, basically is what they're saying. So I, with Malcolm, you know, you know, I brought him a coffee and I brought him, you know, a, a hamburger to keep him warm. You know, I made sure it was McDonald's so he didn't get the wrong impression. You know, I don't want to, you know, pay too much. So keeping him warm, um, and we started talking about footy. And what really came out to me is if you define if you define a, what's a great side, a great side basically bottom line is defined by premierships. That's that's what it is. Um, it's how successful the, the side is. Um, that's a great side. The problem with the AFL and the AFL journos and the culture is a thing called the All Australian. All Australians have individual award. It's like a brown light. It's an individual award. It's not a team based award. So when people measure Richmond, they measure us against Brisbane and they measure us against Hawthorne and they measure us against the Cats. Now, I'll just take the Cats, for example, or we can even do Brisbane. Brisbane had a good top tier of players. If oh, if you ever go have a look at their team, they had some really good quality players. I'm not, I'm not saying they did, innit? You know, I'm outright stars. You know, Voss, Brown, White was criminally underrated, but so is our Edwards, so and so. But they also had good quality, um, what we would call, or what the media calls, role players. What was really a war player? Hart was more of a war role player. Um, though they, they were talented, and they, but they got recognised for their talent because at that back in those days the game was a lot more open. There was no the game was the laws encouraged and uh, you know was a lot more lax, so you could go a lot more offensive. That's why the scores were higher. You know you could clock someone over the head, you wouldn't get five weeks, all that sort of stuff. So they had, they had all that going for them, right? Richmond, on the other hand, is in playing in a very conservative environment, you know, with all these law changes and rule changes and, and all this sort of stuff. But as talent, when people always go about talent, well, no, Brisbane beats Richmond. That's not even the conversation because Brisbane's repeated. I have a count of you. In a team sport, if you're going to measure teams against each other, I think it's fairness, boys, and I'll get your opinion. It's fair. If you're going to measure teams, you have to measure... Uh, measure then the team you can't measure the individuals in the team would that be a fair point well success is rated on overall team performance yes yeah exactly so the way i see it is brisbane had their good three years but then fell off a cliff right that's the fair statement of saying yeah yeah, they weren't the same that yeah it's fair enough yeah um now hawks i rate them still above us because we obviously haven't won our fourth flag yet um, but, you know, um, the Cats, you know, yeah, they, they'll always were there about. They never won back-to-back. We've done that. We're, I believe we're above the Cats. But what my point is, what the myth is, is stop – when you're going to rate sides, stop – I believe Richmond is 
better than Brisbane. And the reason simply is this. Yes, we didn't win three in a row. Is that our success window is longer than theirs. Our success record in relation to game one is better than them, funny enough. Our points four, which I thought that would be a huge difference between the, th- um, between the two sides, is not that great of a difference. Um, so even though we're in this restricted environment, um, you know, we're still generating scores. So what I'm trying to say is take away the names because just look at the results So um, of the team. So if you do that in balance, if you, if you take all the names away and just look at the teams and what they do and um, how they play and what success they get from it, I reckon Richmond at the moment in this modern period is probably the second best side. Um, when I say modern period, I'm not talking about the 80s because then it'll be Hawthorne and Hawthorne, one and two. Let's, all right, let's do that. Hawthorne, one and two. Um, Richmond, I, in my opinion, would be third, um, but coming with a gun, um, if it's just based on team success. So, yeah. Um, I like it. It's, a, it's other, an interesting topic. It's, it, yeah, it's yeah, no doubt controversial, point. but I like it. I'll give, you one, I'll give you one historical fact. Yep. There's only one club in the last 50 years that's won less flags than Hawthorne. Have a guess who that team is. That's Richmond. Yeah, in the Correct. last three years. In the no, last just, 53 years, we've won second most amount of flags out of any team in the league. And Malcolm will be screaming at me because I haven't said his point, because I can ramble a little bit. Now, if you put when they look at these role players, we have like your McIntoshes, your George Castanias and everything. They base those players' performance on our side because our team, we, we coached them. Look, George, like Daniel Rioli, because he's been doing it last season. He's done it this season. His role, one of his roles, I know this is fact, is to close space. Right. It's not necessarily to chase someone. It's, it's, if, the, if the team's got the ball, he runs to a position to block that space so they can't enter a free, you know, a scoring chain into that area. That's no stats for that. There's no recognition for that. But there's a lot of running back and forth, back and forth. And it's unrewarded running. But he does it because it's part of the team. That's what makes us better than anyone else at the moment because we're all the players buying into that. Now, if you went to Daniel Rioli and you put Daniel Rioli in, let's say, Essendon, and, you, and the coach said to Daniel, we want you to kick goals, and we just want you to play like an individual. His performance as an individual will probably skyrocket because he has a lot of ability. He's kicked, what, four in a, in a prelim. That screams it. But we're utilising his strength, which is his endurance, um, one of his strengths, and his creativity when he's got the ball high up the ground um, to the benefit of the team. And he's brought right into it. So... That's important distinction to make because you've got teams like Geelong, let's say, for example, Dangerfield, uh, Bill Clavis, Melangola. They're all great individual players. But I'll tell you something. They don't, they don't change their team. Like Dangerfield doesn't win. He can win the odd game by his own boot. But when the team is, when the team is suffering and he's getting hammered, he doesn't, he doesn't drag that team up. You know, he doesn't do what Selwood does. We've got no. what's fortunate for us. But Selwood's not a bog average player. People go, he's a legend, right? But he's not overly skillful. But all of our players, our, these role players, inverted commas, they all do what Selwood does in the sense of, you know, if, if they hold the line and change the momentum more often than not. Not all the time, but more often than not. And for me, that, that elevates him from that bog average status. Is if you put them, like, have a look. Butler's perfect example. Oh, he was bog average at Richmond. Now he's one of the best um, forwards in St Kilda. Watch Higgins go, and then look. Let's look at Markov, and then look at look at Ellis. Ellis for me is a bit of a disposal hack. Watch these kids; they all look great, um, but they're not better than Rioli. They're not better than George. Yeah, those they'll guys just fill that role a lot better. Yeah, they'll still be at Richmond if they were. Yeah. So you, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. That yeah, got to look uh, at the I, collective. You got to look at the collective because they're playing team. I mean, that's why we're superior. Yeah. We're that, a team. And that's um, why people can't yeah. replicate what we do because everyone's that's got to right. buy into the team mentality. That's um, right. And unless you have that in a genuine capacity, not just saying it, you have to fully believe and buy into it, no one will be able to, well, hopefully, match us for a few years to come. Yeah. I, I like hope it. you don't mind me sharing it. I thought it was, it was Yeah, it was it's controversial. Yeah. I like it because, I mean, those teams are all quality, like you said. So to, I, I, even just taking a step back from that, just to even be able to have this discussion about our own team in that same conversation is just something I never thought would be possible, you know, a few years ago. So we've come a hell of a long way. Um, And, you know, if we manage to pull another one off this year, we could be outright the best of of the lot. But I don't reckon, I I, I seriously think we've got a three year window. Yeah. We've still got got more time than one. Yeah. 
All right, we got we've got the most amount of listener questions on record. So I want to firstly give out a, a huge thank you to our listeners for sending through these questions on Twitter. A lot of new faces as well, which is fantastic. So please make sure you keep them coming through. I've divvied these up. We're going to rip through these as quick as we can because we don't want to blow uh, the time over overboard. Um, but yeah, thank you so much to everyone who's participated in the questions. So. We'll get through these. This first one is from Dustin, uh, and it's for all three of us, and we'll just give a, a quick answer on it. Does the panel think that Caddy holds his spot on the wing? Perhaps he goes forward, or do we think he's not quite in the best 22 as we head into round one, CB? Yes. Yes, he holds his spot. Would you want him on the wing or forward, or both? Just, yes, put him in the team. Just yes. Tiggs, do you want, what's your view on Caddy? Is he in? I agree with the wise man, Yes. He holds his but, spot, and yes, any he look he, he he's such that smart of a player, he, he can play any role. And based on what he did, I know it's a practice match, we've said it, but on Friday against the Pies, he played a great game and put his best foot forward, and he's obviously very desperate to get back into the side. So, I think we're better with him in it. Uh, this next one's for Tiggs. It's from Michael McKenna. How is it possible that Shane Edwards does not make Slobo's top fifty staggering and disrespectful? Look, Slobo, Michael, great question. Look, Slobo is probably the reason why I've done the myth. He looks at Edwards and then compares him, uh, doesn't compare his role in the team and how the t- he doesn't base Edwards, what Edwards does in the side, how it actually creates and creates wins. He bases it on flashy stuff. So, like, you know, that's why he rates, you know, like Dangerfield so highly, even though if you really nut down to it, I don't rate Dangerfield as yeah, he's a good player. I don't run him one of the best ones. So, yeah, look, it is disrespectful. We'll agree with you. Edwards is just – Edwards is on par with Burgoyne. I know Hawks supporters will get upset with me, but Edwards is Burgoyne in his prime. They're different players, but their IQ is staggeringly high um, and the ability to change momentum with just – with very low disposals is, is second to none. He did um, it again on Friday. His handle oh, course, releases – like, he's, he's not slowing down with his mind at all. And Slobo doesn't have the footy IQ to see it. No. That's as simple as that. No, we love Shedder. He is a legend. Uh, this one's for you, CB. This is from Declan. Is Jaden Short the best halfback in the league? He got 43 disposals, CB. That's pretty impressive in anyone's language. Sorry, I, I didn't know you were going to reference that. <laughs> Declan, how are you? <laughs> First of all, what I'm actually going to reference is, um, if you haven't, if you've got some money, Declan, right, He's at 151 to 1 for the brown low. <laughs> if ever there was a smoky. Now, I'll tell you a true story. I went to sports bet before he got put into their thing, and I said, what odds will you give me for Jaden Short on the brown low? And they gave me 1,000 to 1, and I then sent him an email because it's coming to email. I said, oh, yeah. I said, so how do I get to put this bet on? Because it's on an app and app. Next thing you know, I said, oh, you yeah, know, we've added him in, and they chopped it down to 151 to 1. Do you reckon I wasn't putting 50 bucks on Jaden Short at 1,000 to 1? But, um, yeah, the prick stiffed me on that. Now, to answer your question, <laughs> uh, is he the best halfback in the league? Um, I'd say it's too hard to say he's the best because there's guys like Stewart for Geelong. There's some really good footballers out there. But I do think he's in the top five for sure. And the one thing that allows him to be the player is, is our system – allows players to play an aggressive brand of football and to flourish. And um, our system's perfect for him, and he's perfect for our system. There you go. I want to add as well, and I know we've said this before on the show, but his actual defensive side of the game has gotten a lot better since a couple of years ago, and that was what he needed to do. And I'm really enjoying what he's doing. And I think by his own admission, this stand rule is going to play into his hands from from a yeah. kick out. Essentially, we're almost at a 100-meter play with, one, with the first passage to play from a behind if he gets a run at it. It's yeah. scary. Yeah, uh, right. Next one I'll answer from Jason Crowley. Are the Blues halfbacks still better than ours? Uh, <laughs> no, is the short... I mean, you got Liam Jones, who's just <laughs> better than Rance. Um, Jacob Weedering no, is the... Jason. Just Jacob... don't tweet drunk, mate. Don't tweet drunk. It's not Jacob, look Jacob like. Weedering is uh, the next coming of Christ. They're, they're, oh. They send shivers down my spine when I look at them on list. No, look, I think... I do like Doherty, and I'm really, really glad for him as a player that he's overcome injuries and is back playing, to be honest. Um, and Marchbank, when he's down there, is not half bad, but I really, I'm not overly concerned by them. Uh, no. Uh, CB, the next one's from Scott Ryan. Does Liam Baker have some of the most underrated footy smarts? Fox Footy finally made a quick mention on where he goes to stand on the mark with the new rule, uh, but watch some of his intercepts and almost no-look hand passes. Reckon it could be a breakout year. 
It's, it's a funny thing. Like you have the journos and the average dickhead football supporter out there that knows nothing about our list and just says, as Tigger said, bog average footballers. But I reckon if you were to mention the name Liam Baker amongst the AFL landscape and opposition, opposition coaches, I reckon he would be very highly rated and regarded. Um, he's a highly courageous and skilled player. So I think um, externally, the people looking outside the tent, outside the tent looking in, they would underrate him. But I think if you're inside the tent looking out, you'd definitely be saying that Liam Baker is a super footballer. And I agree. I think he will improve again this year. Yeah. Dual sided as well. I know that's a maybe a stupid thing to reference, but you can't underestimate how valuable that is. Oh, and and he's, he's got, got a, a sidestep. Yeah, oh, he's, he just cuts him in half with his agility and his yeah. lateral movement. <laughs> no, he's good. And uh, what's Nick, great, guys, we're seeing the worst of him at the moment. Well, his, his ceiling's only going to get bigger, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, because he's young, so young. We're seeing the worst of him, so it's brilliant. We found a, we found a <laughs> gem there. Uh, next one's for you, Tiggs, from YNWA. I think that's Japania on Twitter. Uh, the best thing about Collingwood getting close late in the game is that it gives their supporters false hope for the coming season. Discuss. Um, is it, did you say Japania? Yes. Is that the name? Yep. Japania, you're, you're an angel from heaven. Um, I agree with you completely. Um, look, Collingwood supporters are, are a rare breed of scum. Um, and they, just, <laughs> you know, well, they are. You know, skunks. They're, they're, look, they're worse than that. That's giving skunks, you know, skunks and innocent creatures just behaving with their natural habitat. Collingwood supporters make a conscious choice to become, um, you know, feces, you know. So... You know, look, it's good. I love them. Let them build their hope. You know, they're walking around. Mason Cox is gobbling off during the game, you know, with the head wobble. It's a practice game, but he's still gobbling off. But his team's still lost, you know. And, you know, they're walking out. Oh, we're close to the Premiers. You know, they're probably still at home now. You know, we're close to the Premiers. Marge, put the chops on. They're, you know, while he's downing his VB, while he beat his child, he's rubbing his preliminary ship medal that he made for himself. You know, he's got the mockers on. He goes down to Frankston Pier and he looks up at the sky. And, while, you know, he's, while he's hate tweeting, while he's hate tweeting with Josh yeah. about Indian workers. Oh, and, and what a dick and, it and, is. And he slops, he slops his, you know, his dentures that he stole from the homeless dude <laughs> in his mouth so he doesn't whistle when he makes his prayer to his, to his, you know, pagan god, wherever it is. And he goes, please, let this be the years. And the typical Collingwood excuse comes back in his brain. We'll be competitive, but we'll blame the injuries. Do you do right. you write this shit down, or you just come out with it on the spot? I just come out. I'm just inspired okay. by the footy. I just inspired by the footy guys. No, I, I hope I hope they got a lot of. Oh, look, they're in. They're, look, their game plan will keep them in games because yeah. they flood. Um, yeah, that's a good. Call. And they're not gonna. They're gonna win a few games because they have got that quality. They have got a quality list, but you know it's lack of firepower though. I think. Oh, I think. it's side bottoms now showing his age. Um, but Pendles, when he starts breaking down. Um, they're in a world of hurt. Yeah. Um, in a world of hurt. Yeah. Love, love, love your, love your question too, by the way. Just, yeah, love your question. One for you, CB, and I couldn't give this to anyone else. Uh, this is from B Clanger 10. Is K-Mac in the top bracket of wingers in the league? His gut running, his gut two-way running is off the charts. He rarely gets beaten. B Clanger, firstly, good evening. And... Um, some people might say I'm a little bit biased about this subject matter. No. But but <laughs> I know, right? But I agree. I actually – but the funny thing is I do agree, and it is because of what you say. He's like elite physically. So he has that ability to just two-way run, and his disposal – that was the big knock on him was his arm. He was a bit of a ball butcher two, two years ago, two, three years ago. He's improved significantly in that area. So he could always run. But now his tank's got bigger again, and now he's actually fixed the disposal. So he's an he's actually a weapon on the wings now, K-Mac, because he's pretty big too. He's about 100... He's a hard he's about, matchup. He's, he's about 193 centimetres. He, he can outmark pretty much most wingers, really, because of his height. And when the ball hits the ground, he is an animal. And there's been multiple 2v1s, 3v1s, and he's, he's halved it. So... He's a beast, and like we said at the start, he's, if he's adding goal kicking on a regular basis to his arsenal because of this stand rule, and he can explode past and go long range, this is huge. And let me tell you, B Clay, I tell you how good K Mac is. He was going bald, and he's been able to regrow hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we love K Mac. He's one of our own. <laughs> I claimed it. I claimed it. Oh, well. Don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> um. 
I'll take the next one from Marky Mark. How do we stop the menace of Mason Cox? I know we've already touched on it, but I'll admit that Mason Cox on Twitter and socials, I actually really enjoy his content. He's a pretty good person uh, to, to read about, and he's got good thoughts and commentary on the game. But carrying on like that in a practice game is just stupid. And he's come out and said that apparently the Richmond Waterboy gave a bit of lip, and that's why he returned serve. But you've got to be better than that, Mason. It's a practice game, and yeah, the Waterboy probably shouldn't have said anything, but just suck it up, move on. Get a few kicks, and uh, yeah, I know everyone's still going to, if you're a Collingwood supporter anyway, you're going to hang off that prelim for the rest of your lives where you play like Wayne Carey. But outside of that, he's done nothing. So just pull your head in. I, look, I give credit to Mason. Like, I, I, I as a bloke, he's, he's got a fairly thick skin. I was, like, salty after the prelim and the final loss, right? And with the company I was working for, I was flying back from Brisbane, and this is, when was it, last year, last off-season? It might have been. Yeah, before all the COVID stuff happened. Um, I'm walking, um, walking, I landed back at Melbourne and the whole Collingwood Football Club, obviously we're on the um, flight. Oh, you know, they they disembarked when I disembarked, right? But we weren't on the same flight, if that makes any sense. So we're getting bags and stuff. So we're going down the escalators and I happen to be behind Mason, right? And like I always do when I travel, you know, I always have a tiger something on. So I had my tiger cap on. And he looked at me and goes, oh, um, too bad about the prelim he actually said that to me and it was but the way he the way he said it the way he said it the way he said it um you know he did it with a bit of you know it was in good nature yeah that's and ban- i said Banter's fine. I, I said look you guys and i have surrounded by collingwood's players right we're going down the escalators just to paint the picture and i just i said well mason you know you know i have to tell you for that day being a west coast supporter was the best feeling in the world and he had a bit of a laugh right and then uh, he's, we, then I couldn't I couldn't believe I said it, right, because I thought I was going to get clobbered. And I said, but I've got to ask you something, Mason. Because what? And I said, you know, being so tall, can you smell your bullshit from up there? <laughs> <laughs> and um, a couple of the players around them looked at me like, you know, what the fuck? <laughs> and he's gone, oh, yeah, good one. You know, and he's, American, he's, a, he's a Texan by his accent. And, um, you know, and I, I, you know, he said, but have a good have a good night, mate. And I walked away feeling like a bit of a tool, right? But also, I have to admit, I had a bit of a head wobble. <laughs> I give it a, <laughs> a show, small way of giving a bit of a slap. But yeah, no. Oh, He's a uh, good guy. Uh, next one for you, CB, from Jill Fitzsimmons. What were the Tigers looking for in Derek Agmolesi Smith's performance? Has he improved in the areas that led to listing? And what's happening with Stack? First of all, good evening, Jill. Um, I think the problem with Egg is it depends on what role he can play in the future for us. Um, I, I don't see him anywhere forward of the ball or on a wing, so that only leaves him as a backup defender. And the whole problem with that is, is he ahead of Nash? Is he ahead of a guy like Hugo? Hooley. Like, I can think of four blokes that can all play his role better than him. Um, so, unfortunately, I well, what my gut tells me, I'd be highly amazed if he gets that last spot on the list. If I'm honest with you, um, and that's not that's not knocking the poor bloke. I just I, I just think there's other people um, ahead of him on the pecking order right now with just the list development and how we've recruited. Um, with with regards to Stacky, um, the reality is there. His court case is going to be heard on the 23rd of March. So to be honest, it's, it's unknown to everybody. And and uh, being over in Western Australia with their current with their premier, um, God knows what the outcome will be. Hopefully he gets back soon and can fit in. I mean, yeah. really, we're not going to see him until halfway through the year at best if yeah. he cracks back into the AFL yeah. side. And that's fine. It is what it is. That's right. He won't uh, be playing until probably around 16, 17. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, next one for you, Tiggs. The next couple of you, actually. From Trog and Tiger, firstly. <laughs> I'm wondering where Nash fits into our team, if at all. Look, I reckon he fits... Look, obviously, I've got a, I've, I have got a soft spot for Nash. Not because, I don't. you know, he's a nice guy and all... He's got a large upside. He has a lethal left and right foot. He, he can kick on both sides. He's got a bit of speed. It's all about confidence for Nash and getting his body right. He's a very light young kid, but he's a really great character. I reckon he's got a place on the wing. I serious, I know he's not as tall, but he's got that lightning ability um, to transition from defence to forward. He could even be played as a halfback flanker. Um, and fit into the um, – or even played as a small forward if we if we need to. So he gives us options. Unlike 
someone like um, Derek, for example, can only play in really one position. He can play in multiple positions um, for a bit of a dynamic. And, yeah, I think he has to take that. The club does too. I heard Dimmer talk about him, and they've got a lot of – they're bullish about him. Um, it's just that um, he's, he's going to take a while to develop. Um, and what's great for us, we're allowing players to have that time to develop, like RCD and and yeah. Nash, you know, to get to get the proper, you know, get all the tools ready before we put them out there. So yeah, I, I reckon he fits into our team. Good That's, question, um, Traugan. It's a good call because there's no pressure on him, which is nice from yeah. a having to break in point of view. Uh, the next two I've combined for you, Tig. So the first one is uh, it's a two part question. The first <laughs> one's from the tail. Is there any indication what we may do with our draft hand this year? We're looking to load up in the draft. And the second question which is on a similar topic, is from Johnny B. Good. Is the focus for our two first-round picks mids or talls? I'm thinking a key forward and a back. Yeah, um, good question, um, guys, um, Tail and, and Johnny. Um, look, it, from what I can gather, I've already got a couple of names listed, which I won't break yet, um, but I will do early in the year. I'm just uh, waiting for the football season. Generally, by round six or round seven, I'll, ask a few, I'll have a few beers um, with them face-to-face and you know, sort of nut down my list. But... Um, the way I see it is the COVID salary cap reduction really impacted our ability to hunt. Most clubs are in the same boat. Um, we do have – we do have. Um, so I don't want to give you like a sitting on the fence, Asher, but the way I sort of see it is there is a big strong feeling that the salary cap restriction will rub a band back uh, earlier than most teams think. Um, so hopefully it's this off-season or well, next off-season. If that's the case, we get more cap again – um, I see us hunting another target, and there's a few um, that we are. That a couple of names on the whiteboard, as they say. Um, I know we've done a bit of work with last year, um, so I don't see them being dismissed. Um, but in saying that, um, we've got Geelong's pick, we've got the pick for Higo, Higgins for next year as well. So the reason we've sort of got those picks the way I see it, which makes me a bit more bullish, I think we might do half and half. I think we might use some of those picks to actually get a kid, some of those picks to trade for another established player to fill a weakness. Because one thing I do know, and from what I got given, is we're in our window. Our window is still, you know, three, four years open. But we need to keep it open. And generally having a 17 or 18-year-old, yeah, they might have a bit of talent, but they're going to take about two years to get into the system. We might be going, okay, let's get someone that's already had a bit of development in another club that's talented, bring them in, keeps our window going a bit longer, um, and, you know, it gets to play with the likes of the RCDs and the other kids, um, you know, that we've been developing as well. So, yeah, we've still got a few names, and I, I promise you guys, as soon as I get um, the OK to release these two particular names, I will. I'll, as soon as I get the OK, I'll, I'll do it. So, Very yeah, good. I'll let you guys know. All right, next question for you, CB, from Le Tigre. Uh, is, we've kind of touched on it. Is Chol better suited in Ruck or as a Ford? Is he worth persisting with? Oh, 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 oh. Le Tigre. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> right. So racist. Oh, that is racist. <laughs> right, so I feel like I'm going to shoot Bambi here, but bugger it, I am actually. Chol has pissed me off, and he pissed me off last year, if I'm honest with you. Um. My big issue with Mabia is he got exposed in finals last year with a lack of physicality, and we saw it again at times versus the Pies. So he hasn't improved. Like There's a couple of times he's got brushed aside in one-on-one marking contests. And the frustrating thing is you watch him, you watch that happen, and then all of a sudden he'll do something fantastic. Like, you know, at ground level, he takes a big mark in the back line, and you're like, man, if we could just put the mongrel of a Wayne Carey in this guy, he'd rip the competition apart. But I just don't think – he's very laconic. I don't think he's got that animalistic drive in him to be any better. So, personally, I actually don't see him making it long term. Um, but if I was going to play him anywhere, as previously discussed, I would actually play him as a mobile – as a ruckman. I think he's better mobile rather yep. than being positioned in a forward line. But he really – Frustrates the living bejesus out of me. If I'm honest with you, that's my answer. Yeah. Can I can I just add to that? You do not. He's def, I think he'll make it if he's if he's in the right team for him. Just remember the pork game, where he he got the ball on the half back flank, beat three poor players by running down the fat side of the ground. Did the team thing by pushing the ball forward, but had the tank enough to keep on running. 
to get the ball after the contest and get it to Jack Greywall. Who kicked Fantastic. The One thing. Yeah, no. no. The amount but, of times I've seen no, him no, get but you also said, and... Yeah, I know. I get it. That's in the forward line. He's not a forward. But you even said, you know, in the ruck. No, I've seen that no, on the wing. On the yeah, wing, you got brushed okay. aside by bloody the ex bulldog yeah, reject. Yeah, I well look, I think there's definitely um Letagre, I think there's definitely um he's got definitely uh, he's worth persisting with, yeah, most, no doubt. That's my opinion. Kind of got no choice for the first part of the season anyway. Um, yeah. We've invested enough time for him, might as well see give him the year. See you know, play. Yeah. I think he has to be a ruck and that's it. I don't think he can play forward. But um yeah, as long as he makes a contribution, that's all we can ask. The next one I'll take from the tail with all the Cubs showing something this week. Which ones can you see having an impact? And with the with the cutoff on Wednesday, can you see Egg Melissa Smith getting the final list spot if, if it's not already announced? Um, it's weird. I've kind of flipped and flopped on the, the last spot. I, I kind of at one stage felt that it, it was Gallucci's to lose, but then we kind of haven't seen him really since the Melbourne game. Uh, and he didn't really set the world on fire there, if I'm being honest. But then the egg sort of gets the... He played a really good game against Melbourne, plays the game against Collingwood, albeit limited, did some okay things, but it kind of feels like we've got players in that role. And Green's the other one that potentially has the highest ceiling out of the three. Um, and my little side theory to that is if we sign Green, it's a bit of a bit of bait to try and get his brother over from the Giants, who's got Richmond connections, and it might just add a little nice piece of the puzzle there along with our draft picks. But that's a bit of a conspiracy and probably wishful thinking, but you never know. Uh, as for the other young kids, I agree with what um, I think you said, CB, earlier, that RCD is probably going to get a lot of games. I think Dow might get a few more games as well this year, who's, who showed some really good signs. So... Our young players are exciting. We've got a lot to work with. And as we sort of said, the best part is we haven't had to rush development. We've let them go at their own speed. Like what the, the Hawks players did in their in their prime, they were able to bring in a man, one man in, one man out, and it was seamless. We're going to be the exact same. So it's a good spot to be in. Enjoy the ride and watch the VFL as much as you can because it's going to be really exciting to watch. Um, TIG71, the next one for you from Lee Williamson. This is our last two questions. Just watching Himmelberg, and I really think he would be a great Jack Rerolt replacement. Any chance we are chasing him? I, From what I've heard, no. We were. Um, we had been. His name's come up. But no. Okay. And the last one from Rhett Weeks for you, CB. What do we think of Collier Dawkins going forward? Will he play many games this year? G'day, Rhett. How are you, mate? Um, I really liked what he did on the ball, if I'm honest with you. Yeah. He, show, he showed that he's um, improved physically. Yep. Like he was actually standing up in tackles and distributing the ball out. Um, so for me, I think on the ball is where his future's at. And I think he and uh, Jack Ross will definitely get game time through the middle this year. I just like him more in the middle. I think he's, that, that's more his go. It's natural, isn't than, it? Yep, than playing forward. That's just and my I, take. The only thing I want to say is for people who were maybe critical of the, the couple of times he got caught holding the ball, don't let that scare you. Like the, the fact he's got the balls this early on when he's trying to, to get a game to back himself, um, I think is a good thing. He's only going to learn from the pace of the game and he'll, he'll correct those things. Very similar to what Shea Bolton was doing early on. Try to take on a few too many tackles, got caught, but he'll get better. And I, I love seeing players try and do that. And what I loved about that, you could tell Dimmer said to him, "We want you to be, we want you to create, you know, be daring, to be himself." And, got, and that's been our big yeah. thing: he's being himself. And if that's what he wants to do, I think that's good. Yeah, it's great. He'll get better. I, I, I hope he plays games. I hope, I hope we bite the bullet and say, "Okay." But like CB said, you know, we've got this. You know, you, you put him in, who do you put it put out? That's the great position we're in. Yeah. You know, it's you know Graham. You know Jack Graham. We didn't mention him, but he had a great game. I yeah, thought. he's looking good. He's looking good. He's looking really good. He's, he's, he's beefed up a bit, but he's kept slim, if that makes any sense. You know what I mean? He looks a lot more solid, more yeah. of a unit. Um, yeah, so I mean, he's still got Ross to play. It's it's great. It's exciting times to be a Tiger. Yeah, it's great. Well, thank you so much again to listeners for sending through all those questions. It was, yeah, like I said, it was the, the most amount we've ever had through, uh, but we're always more than happy to answer your questions because without you guys, the show wouldn't exist. So keep sending them through as the weeks go on. Um Thanks for your time tonight, fellas. Now, next week, we'll be talking about a round one game. How, how good is that? Yes. It's come around. Anyone got any early prediction? Pain. Yeah, look, I, I, I tell Pain. you what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I actually stole, right, I went to an old Channel 10 set, yeah. and I've actually stolen Dexter, right? And I've rewired and reprogrammed Dexter, and he'll be helping with my football predictions uh, as far oh. as margins are concerned this year. So, oh, Jesus. very excited. <laughs> 
I had a look for Delveen Delaney, couldn't find her, but I've got Dexter, <laughs> right? So we, we need to actually keep track of the predictions this year. I know Trog and Tigers kept a few of us accountable on Twitter. We need to uh, yeah, that's keep bullshit, record of this. You need to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> you can't blame people for keeping us accountable. <laughs> No, I'm very much looking forward to next week's show with a, a nice look yep. towards round one. We get to try and pick a team and do all those kind of fun things. So footy season is almost back for round one, uh, and we're very much looking forward to it. So thanks again for your time tonight, guys. And until next time, go Tigers. Go Tigers. I'm Rick James. Go Tigers.